Welcome back to Sahara TV. My name is Rudolf Okonkwo. On Friday, August 23rd, our next guest was kidnapped in Edo State. Mike Ozekome, a senior advocate of Nigeria and a human rights lawyer, was kidnapped and he spent 20 years, at, sorry, excuse me, 20 days in, in, in the kidnapper's den. And he's now with us to tell us about his experience and what what his reflections on that is. Mr. Ozekeme, welcome to Sahara TV. Yeah, thank you very much, Sahara. You are doing a great job, doing a great job. You are doing a great job. We are so happy, we are so happy that you, you survived this experience. And we want you to, to please help us understand, how did this happen? Where were you kidnapped? Yeah, it was actually on the 23rd of August, 2000. 13. I wasn't traveling in the wee hours of the morning, nor was I traveling in the dead of night. And to me, that is one of the dangers in the entire episode. For God's sake, I was traveling in the hot afternoon to, to borrow from Ayi Kwe Ama's book, The Beautiful Ones Are Not Yet Born, in the hot baking afternoon sun about past 2 p.m. I was on my way from Benin to Ijukwe, Agenebode, my hometown, to go and commiserate with the larger Ozekome family where we had lost the head of the family, Alhaji Yakubu Abu, who died about two or three days earlier. And um, I guess after Iho, there's a valley there trying to ascend towards Iro Ekben near Ekboma. I was on the phone with one brother, Anabui, a brother in the Knights of St. Molumba, I mean, Knight of the Catholic Church. And I was asking him questions about the examination that was coming up for us at Marymount Secondary School, Agbo. On Saturday, the following day at 10 a.m., I was asking him what and what are those questions we are likely going to face, having not done before, done it before, like maybe past questions, so that from there one could know what he was going to face. And we were still talking when suddenly we saw a, a, a kind of roadblock in front. A vehicle had been put across the road in a way that no other vehicle would pass. <clears throat> and a helos bus, white in color, was right in the middle of it. And I was telling the person on the phone, you hold on, I'm seeing something in front, I don't know what it is, you hold on, you hold on. And then my driver told me, Oga, it be like saying that arm robbers, they operate, meaning it looks as if armed robbers were operating. Then I told him, then you slow down quickly and beat the retreat. Put the car on reverse so that we can run back to Benin. As he attempted to put the car on reverse, behold, a man came from the bush holding an automatic gun. I do not know how to describe guns. Um, but I always hear of things like AK-45, AK-54. I do not know, but I know this was obviously a very, very heavy automatic gun. Mm. He had it to my ear, to my head, and said, if you move an inch, I will blast your head. Mm. I will kill you. Don't even think about it. And as he was saying it, he was telling my driver, you get out of the car and leave the key there. And he shot at the tire of the car so as to demobilize it. Mm, mm. So, so you it can say that you were, you were, you were you're not targeted? <clears throat> oh, no. Oh, certainly I was not targeted. I ran into it just as the hillocks before me ran into it. 
I was not targeted at all. Mm. It was not political. Mm. I was not I was not a target. I was not profiled. Mm. And to me, that is the danger in it all. The danger in it all is that it could have been any Nigerian. Mm. It could have it could have been a bishop, it could have been a minister, it could have been a poor prison farmer, it could have been a market woman, it could have mm. been a student, mm. it could have been anybody. Mm. And before I knew what was happening, they bundled me out of the car and put me in a, in a small car of their own and put my driver in the boat and told us to lie down inside the car and freeze the, 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 the car. Mm. And, I, and I lay down, freezing down. And before I knew what was happening, I had them say, oh, police, 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 police are coming, police are, police are coming, police are coming. And then there was a barrage and staccato of, of, of firing, of mm. bullet, cross firing. It was a war situation. I could hear exchange of gunfire. And some of them were pressing me down, sitting on me, apparently so that the bullets would not get at me. Oh God, it's a miracle. Mm. My captors, my abductors were themselves sitting on me, pressing down on me so that bullets will not affect me. And as they were changing fire, it, they, they were telling each other, advance, no retreat, no surrender. Advance, no retreat, no surrender. And then they said again, oh, see a second one coming, see a second vehicle coming, another vehicle of police. And then they started another barrage of, 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 of staccato firing again. And then I was shivering inside the car. I was so disorientated. I, I, I didn't expect it. I had never experienced that kind of thing, not even in all my human rights days when I was detained several times by the military. Because at, at least in those days, members of the public would know who detained you, where you were detained, for what offense or alleged offense we were detained. But here were kidnappers taking me away to, to, to a destination I do not know or I did not know. Now, now do, do you then, know, how did the police come to that scene at that point? Do you know? I would never know. But from what I started hearing when I came out two days ago, um, I'm hearing different versions of it. Some people are saying that there was a distress call. That, that there was a robbery going there, mm. and the police decided to come there. Some say it was the kidnappers themselves who gave a false call to the police so as to come there, maybe kill them, ambush them, mm. kill them, mm. and then take their arms. But I was a victim myself, so mm. I wouldn't know mm. what happened. You know, I just know that after that, they were boasting as we were going away. They started saying, oh, we have killed some of the police. We have killed some of them, then by tomorrow, they would come out and say in the newspapers uh, falsely that they killed some of us, mm. whereas none of us had been injured at all, mm. not to talk of being killed. Mm. And then the, the long journey started. A very tortuous, very labyrinthine journey on highways, on, 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 on tarred roads, on footpaths in the forest. Of course, we were made to fade down the car. I met another young man, he said, who was the driver, obviously, of the Hillos bus, who was shivering. That one head on to me. I will sit down so nobody will allow us to know where we were being driven to. And they drove for more than three, three to between three and four hours. Wow. <laughs> were you, were you still in Edo State or you don't know? No, I, I wouldn't know at all. But I know they drew, drove for over three and a half hours, half hours to four hours. I wouldn't know where we were. And why I do believe that I was never profiled is that when we got inside the car, they asked me very preliminary questions. They said, you, you stupid man at the back, what is your name? I said, my name is Chief Mike Ozekome. They said, I see. What do you do? I said, I'm a lawyer by profession. They said, how long have you practiced? I said, I have practiced for about 32 years. Then he told one of them who was sitting, because on each side of us were other uh, fully armed ones. They were all masked, you know, uh, holding automatic weapons. He said, search him, search him. They searched me, removed my wristwatch, my ring, uh, the money in my pocket, and my complimentary cards. Then the one in front <clears throat> started looking at the complimentary cards. I said, I want to know your full names 
So I said, my full names are Chief Mike Ozekome, S-A-N. He said, yes, go ahead. Then I remember what I have on my card. Then I said, constitutional lawyer and human rights activist. Then he said, oh, yes, you are correct. You are a man of, of honesty. That is what is on your card. Now, then um, he said, you see, we have to do what we are doing because we have to get from the society what they have deprived us of. We, we, we are suffering. We are graduates. We have the dependents. No one listens to us. A little percentage of the society has cornered the entire wealth of the nation to the detriment of the vast majority of people. And my brother, they were speaking impeccable Queen's English. Very, very educated and enlightened people. Mm. And they drove us for about three and a half hours to a point where uh, it was now getting dark. Uh, it was now about to some minutes to 7 p.m. And then <clears throat> about to 7 p.m. And then they, 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 changed, they changed the vehicles. You know, they, they, there was another batch of them that they now handed us over to. And then the second batch of vehicles drove us again for about another 30 minutes or more. And then finally dropped us somewhere where they told us to come down and face down. That was the first time I now noticed that. Apart from myself and my driver, they had captured other people, probably in the other hillers and other vehicles. And they marched us in a single formation. If you, if you remember the picture of slaves, the way slaves were marched in those days, um, when, when they were taken to American sugar and tobacco plantations for over 500 years in a single fire with their legs manacled and their, and their necks chained. The only difference is that our legs were not manacled, nor our, our chains, and nor, nor, nor our necks chained. But they told us to be sit down while going beh uh, behind the person in front. And that was how they marched us through rocky terrain through swamps, through, um, through uncleared road in the forest, in the dark. One of them holding a very small point torchlight. They were warning continuously, don't try to escape. If you try to escape, we will shoot you down without blinking. So don't even think about it. Of course, no one in his right senses was going to escape in a dense forest whose environment or topography you do not know. They marched us for another 25 to about 30 minutes into a little mosquito infested uncompleted building where we were made to sit on the floor, trembling, trembling, wondering whether death had come. And they waited till the dead of the night. Much, much later, about two or three hours later, they took us up again and marched us again in another forest to a second detention center where we were to stay for the first 14 days. It was horror here on earth. It was most horrific, to put it mildly. It was spine chilling. It was mentally excruciating. It was psychologically traumatic. It was physically debilitating. It was psychically exacting. It was spiritually draining. To put it mildly, mm. it is the nearest thing to death. Because in the room where I now discovered the other two people, Athanasio Ubome and Maka Omorobe, three of us were kept in the same room where our two drivers were kept our two more drivers were to join our two drivers to make four because they had again brought in a woman, her two sons, and a daughter and a driver, and two other women and their driver, meaning that we were 13 in the camp. Hmm. And some of these women, children, their ages range between about 13 to about 22. It was the shame. Of the country. Now, how is the typical and day uh, in that in that detention center? How does that? What do you do? What, what was it like? 
it was waiting for death at best because they they clank they were clanking the guns every every minute of the day you will hear the gun making count count kind of cocking the gun to mm. tell you they were ready to shoot any time and they will come in at times and terrorize you they will come and, and terrorize you and say look we will kill you we will throw your body into the river or we will package your body uh, like pieces of meat and, and send it to your wife and send it to your children and that the government of nigeria will want to shop them we will kill you that so that they will know that they have no a security apparatus that can capture us. Oh, they are mad. They, they think they have the security. They don't have the wherewithal. And <coughs> you can imagine threats coming on your head 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Mm. When when we were go to the toilet, you have to be in the toilet. The door has to be open because someone carrying a gun. So so there is toilet in the in the building. Oh yes. It's a normal thing, a normal building. Okay. What it's about feeding? Outside. How were you fed? How were you fed and, uh, and those kind of things? Yes. Uh, we noticed that <clears throat> it's like they will go to town to go and buy food or they go to town to go and buy cooking ingredients. They had a kitchen in the small building. We will hear the smell of cooking, the odor of cooking. Mm. They will cook. They will give us either jollof rice or eba and a goosey or a bono soup. At times, um, in the morning, they may just give us tea and the slices of bread. Mm. But um, we embarked on fasting. For the first time, we fasted for about 48 hours. We did not touch food. And I think that gave them cause for concern. I think they thought we were on hunger strike. Well, <coughs> what, we what did they do? Did they force you to eat? No, they didn't force us to eat. They never forced us to sit. They even came. They, they are heard that they called general. Um, the, the group that operated on us seemed to have three generals. They said they had three generals, then field commanders. So they are here. The general was always interacting with us. They were always masked, hooded with masks, so you could never see anyone, mm. whether in the afternoon or in the night. They were always hooded with masks. He, he came and asked us, why didn't you eat? We learned you have not eaten in the last two days. We said, yes, we were fasting. Uh, to seek the face of God. They say, okay, well, you better seek the face of God mm. because uh, this may be your last <coughs> your last days on earth. Mm. Now, and uh, either, either they left us, they left us worse than they met us because we saw death mm. tearing us in the face. Mm. Now, let's, let's, talk, we a, up, let's yeah. talk about co contact with your family. Were you allowed to contact your family or did they contact your family for you? Yes, what they did was that after they, um, they, uh, they took us on a Friday, the following day on Saturday, they came and said, do you have anybody you want to contact? I said, yes, yeah, sure. They said, who? I said, my wife, number one. Then my friend, Ben Sibano, number two. They said, do you know their numbers? I said, my wife's number, I know off my heart. But my friend's number, I do not know. They went and brought my five phones. I said, which of these phones can we get your number? I pointed out one, and then they put on the battery. That was when I noticed that when they seize your phone, they remove all the batteries so that there will be no contact, no tele, no communication or tracking. So they put it on briefly. I said, I have to get the number quickly. So I got out my friend's number, and they quickly removed the battery again. Then how they now contacted my wife or my friend, I do not, I never knew. But I just knew that on a Monday, they come and they came with, to me with the phone and said, speak to your wife. That was the first time my wife knew I was alive and she was elated. Sweetheart, are you alive? I said, yes, I am alive. Um, how are you doing? I said, I'm here. I'm well. I'm, I'm not dead. I'm alive. At least get that sucker that I'm alive. So she was elated. They gave the phone to my, my, my friend. I also told my friend I was alive. But I didn't then know what they were negotiating with my friend. But they did come to me to say on my head, because of the publication they have already seen coming out on me, that I must be a very well-respected Nigerian, a very high heeled Nigerian, that it was going to be 850 million naira that my family must pay. And then I told them, I have never seen that kind of money since I was born. Goodwill and fame 
you say, I have sure, by the grace of God, because of what Nigerians um, I think I have done, my little contribution, my modest contribution to human rights, to democracy, to good governance, to rule of law, to development. I say, but that does not itself translate into fiscal cash. We can never have that money. And they say, well, if you do not have the money, then you must have friends who have that money. I say, I do not have friends that you will just go and meet and say, give us 850 million naira. No Nigerian will have that kind of money. They say, then in such a case, then we are going to kill you. We will kill you and send your meat as parcels to shock the government. And, you know, it, 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 it was fear of terror and fear of fear. It was on a minute by minute basis. You know, you find yourself dying instrumentally. Mm. You find yourself dying piecemeal. Mm. You find your you, you, you find your, your life draining away. Mm. But you know what? I held on to my God. I told my God, I said, You are the same God that delivered Paul and Silas, mm. that delivered Daniel from the den of lions, that delivered Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego from the furnace of fire, that delivered Jesus Christ from the tomb after three days. I said, that same God offered me. You are not going to lie now. I told God. And I promised God I would never shed a single tear here. Because if I cry here, then I'm dignifying and edifying the devil. Mm. Not for me. I would rather shed tears of joy for you when I am finally released. Mm. That was what I told God. And I tell you, my brother, the first time I cried was two days ago during the first conference mm. when I came out as I promised my God. And mm. it was tear of joy. Now, you said what? that you were sick and, and they brought in doctors who had... Oh, hoods. yes. How did that... Where, where did they get the doctors from? What, what is that experience like? Yeah. What happened was that we were, we were, we were, we were kidnapped on, on a Friday by Thursday, we were in the, in, the, in the room, which was very stuffy. The windows were locked, three of us. Um, the, the mattress they gave to us was six by four and a half. So we had to lie down half of it uh, with our legs on the ground, uh, with half of the body on the ground. So the mattress was wet and soggy and smelly and dirty and uh, uh, putrefied. And uh, of course, when one of them came in mass, he saw that the place was as hot. He made the comment, oh, my God, this place is as hot as fire. So he was kind enough to open the, one of the windows, uh, the, one of the louvers in the window. And by opening it, we got some air for the first time, which we breathed. We were happy to have fresh oxygen in as we were breathing out carbon dioxide. But then that itself introduced Another problem we never emphasized, a colony, a, a very angry colony of mosquitoes, like an invading army, descended on us in the room and started feasting on us, you know, like in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, like, like barbecue, they barbecued us, you know, like um, the way you go for a buffet dinner. That night, we could not sleep at all, but the following morning, all my body, was swollen with bombs, with, with boys from mosquito bite. And the mosquitoes had eaten us so much that they could not even fly. Some of them were, were sitting down, lame dog. You can imagine a mosquito sitting down, lame dog, without the ability to fly. Mm -hmm. And you, you kill one of them, you will see the blood splattered on the ground. And it was automatic <laughs> that medically we were we were prone to malaria, and by the following day, we were all shivering with malaria. So when the general came in, we could now recognize him by his voice, because he was always mad. He said, how are you feeling? We said, we are all sick. He said, what is the problem? We said, we have malaria. It is clear to us we have malaria. He said, don't worry. Our doctors will come in in the night to see you. And then in the night, uh, they brought in another of them who was hooded who said it was their doctor, who asked us, and we told him, he said, don't worry, we will bring you drugs tomorrow. And by the following day, they brought us drugs, a malaria drugs that we took for the next day, two days. Then we became 
more stabilized. But of course, the fear of fear was always there. Then on my own part, <clears throat> I fell ill a second time. Uh, another Thursday, I think that was Thursday, on the Thursday, the fifth, fifth. Um, I was suddenly sweating. Um, I told them, look, I may look so young. You look at me, I look such a young man. I am 55 years old, 5'5". Five, five. I said, I'm, I'm, I have a son, I'm, and my son has three children. I am a grandfather. I'm not a, I'm not a little child. So um, um, this thing is heavy on me. I feel the best part of my youth fighting for freedom for Nigerian masses. I didn't think this was going to be how I would be paid back by the same society. And then I fell really ill, and it was very traumatic. And uh, my two co detainees in my room started fanning me. They started pouring water on me. And then when they came in, we told them, they called in their, they said their doctor would speak to me. And they connected the phone later. And I spoke to their doctor who, who asked me what, how I was feeling. And I told him. And the doctor said he would come in the night to come and treat me. And he came in the night, as usual, who did. They have small touch light. And then uh, he, he gave me two injections on, on, on the two sides of my, of my buttocks, on each buttock. Do you know what, the, then, what is the medication for? Yes, they were, they were treating me for malaria and, and typhoid. Okay. And then um, to assure me, when he saw me getting treated, he said, well, don't think we are going to poison you. We will not poison you. We just need the money from you. So he showed me the serine and then um, the, the, the injection bottles. I said, look, I, I want to break them in your presence. You can read them. And I looked at them. And then <clears throat> he gave me one on my artery intravenously. And that one, he said, was for typhoid. And then um, they treated me that night. And from the following day, I really became better. I felt much better. Mm. So, um, so it is, I want to tell you, it's a properly organized uh, segment of the society. Mm. They made it clear that in their cell unit alone, that they were up to 200. Mm. Of course, in our little camp, they were no less than 25 mm. that were guarding us day and night mm. with automatic weapons. Mm. Whether you were in the toilet, your door was open, they would be looking at you. Whether you were in the bathroom, your door was open, they would look at you. Whether you were sleeping and you wake up, you meet that people are holding guns. And if they are not holding God, they must make sure they lock your door and they lock you in and take the key away. Mm. So <clears throat> they made it clear that if for any reason security agents were to invade that place or to try to take us away, that the first victims would be us, that they would simply turn around and shoot us dead and waste us because they knew that we are the subject of a possible um, uh, evacuation. They will first kill us mm. and then face the invaders. Mm. And they made it clear mm. that they were ready to take on a battalion of mm. soldiers mm. because the whole forest, according to them, was, was um, they were hiding in every portion of that forest because they wouldn't take chances. Mm. Okay. Then, now, <coughs> sorry, well, we, we have like four minutes left. Let me ask you, so yeah. how were you freed? Did, did, did you pay, did someone pay the ransom on your behalf? Yeah, I wouldn't know. Okay. I wouldn't know. I know they were talking to my friend. They were negotiating. My friend said at the time, I, I left at the time. At the time, they now came to me and said, yes, we have reduced your money to 150 million naira. And I told them, I wouldn't get that kind of money. How would I ever get it? Mm. <clears throat> and, you, and they said, look, well, the whole world seems interested in your release. Uh, the whole social media, the whole internet, the whole television stations, the whole newspapers, Nigerians appear to want you. That means you must have people love you. You must. I say I don't know. They love me for what I'm doing. That does not mean that they have cash for me. Mm. So I wouldn't know if anything was paid. Mm. I have not been able to discuss with my family or friends to know if anybody paid anything. No, they did tell me something was paid. Mm. But they made it clear that they were holding me because they wanted money, mm. and that they were angry youth of Nigeria, mm. and that the next election was going to be very violent because they were going to come out in full to fight these politicians who, according to them, buy them guns. And after the elections, 
they dump them. Mm. They never, they never give them their due. Mm. They allow them to go and suffer. Mm. Now, and now you, you, that, you said because we are running out of time, wish we have more time. You said that um, they should be granted amnesty, uh, uh, otherwise yeah. because um, uh, they, they said that they should be granted amnesty. But again, you also. Yeah. You also know that in a do state, for instance, there's a bill uh, waiting for the governor to sign that will actually impose death penalty on kidnappers. Uh, how are let these? Me, let me tell you. For, let me tell you from my experience, mm. that bill would be very dangerous to sign the death penalty. First, as a member of the Amnesty International, as a human rights activist, and looking at the Ten Commandments of God, Thou shalt not kill. I have never believed in the death penalty, and they made it clear that if they sign the bill of death, they will now know that the death penalty is there for them and that they will now go brutal when they capture people mm. or like the, the way they were, they had not killed us. Mm. I would advise that. I ask them, what is the solution then? They say, the solution is they are a very angry, educated segment of the society. Many of them speak, spoke like people read English language, philosophy, history, political science, you know, medicine and all that. They said, if the government can set up an amnesty, I say, will you come out? They say, yes, yeah, sure. They will come out. If the government assures them of, 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 no, of no retribution, they will drop their hood and mask and drop their guns, give up the guns to the government, come to a round table and discuss that, they are, that it is on employment. Some of them said they have been uh, educated, I mean, out of the university for five years, six years, 16 years. They have no job. And that they have a right to also live and enjoy the good things of life like one percent of the society that they said has cornered the society i therefore ask the government to give them amnesty so that we can remove these violent nigerians angry nigerians desperate nigerians from the jungles mm. to the table mm. and then to also declare a state of emergency on youth unemployment mm. <clears throat> so that they can have employment and capacity building on a declaration of state of emergency on educational decay, infrastructural decay, mm. because these are what they themselves complain. In interactive sessions, in the night, two times they called me outside, in the dark, with all of them who did, to have interactive sessions with me. They said, well, we have seen from all you are reading about you that you are pro massive that you have been fighting for the people. We therefore want you to know why we are doing what we are doing, why we are angry. Because mm. we know you will also let the society know mm. you are so fearless, you are so courageous, you, we don't seem to frighten you. I told them because my life, my, my life is in the hands of God. Mm. That is why I fear no man, I fear no bullet. So <clears throat> we had interactive sessions. And they made it clear that if the government can do something about youth unemployment, about um, amnesty for them, that they will put down their guns and make Nigeria peaceful. Mm. That otherwise, in 2015, it will be worse for all Nigerians. All right. they, they, they spoke impeccable English. Mm. I can tell you, these are educated Nigerians and an armed segment of the society. And do you know what? They even gave me the theory that shocked me. Mm. They said, uh, Sam, Sam, sir. I said, yes, sir. They said, Sam, sir, have you heard that? the prediction that Nigeria may break up by 2015? I say, yes, that's what a lot of people are saying, including some Americans. He say Nigeria may not break up as an entity, as per one corporate entity. <clears throat> I say, then how? He said Nigeria may break up in units. I say, how? He said when some units of the society are controlled, like them controlling some parts of the society in more than 25 states of the Federation, and they have networking, and they can make a call in six states away when they are holding a person in another state. They go to a highway in another state to go and make the call, to go and originate the call. So that if security agents are looking for them, they, go, they will be deceived to stay states away from where the detainee is. They say, if we can control some parts of, this, of the society, it means that those, those parts have broken, have degenerated, mm. have, have fallen apart. Mm. They are no longer a part of the entire corporate entity. They, that was their reason, their wow. theory. Wow. And I was shocked mm. because I had never, I had never theorized nor reasoned it like that myself. I had always seen Nigeria dis dismembering maybe as a country, everyone go to their tents, all Israel. Mm. They say it may not be like that. Mm. They say, well, we are fully armed now. We are taking over some, we are taking over the highways. We are taking over the forest. We are taking over the street. Some people have taken over the air. Some are taking over the sea. They said that is another equivalent 
of a breakup of a country. Mm. Can you see their theory, their reasoning? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mr. Zakame, thank you so much for coming to Sahara TV. Yes. We really appreciate um, that. Uh, we are happy that you are been, free, and um, we hope okay. that um, we continue this discussion. Yes, yes I, I want to thank God. I want to, I want, I want you to let the world know that the greatest thanks, glory, and adoration go to God, mm. who delivered me from instant death. Because if God does not will, as He says in three Lamentations, thirty-seven, He say, "Who is it that speaketh, and He cometh to pass?" If the Lord has not affirmed it, it is God that has found that I would. Uh, you know what? They also tricked my son, a lawyer, and my junior lawyer. They said the only people they wanted to negotiate with at the time, on which was on a Friday, the 6th of this month, would be my son, Barrister Ilubeka Ozekomek, and my junior lawyer in my Abuja office, Barrister Dominic Ezerioa, and that they were no longer ready to negotiate with my friend, Barrister Ben Sigbano. Because of that, they called them up, and they said they must come for negotiation. And by the time they, they came there without telling me, they captured my son also, captured my general lawyer, and brought them to join us hmm. to say, well, you are out here now. We want our money. Hmm. And, and they, they, they call it our money hmm. as if we were owing them. Owing them. So, right. my brother, hmm. the danger in it is that we were not to fight. Mm. The danger in it is that it could have been anybody, anybody yeah. in the society. Anybody, yeah. Please, anybody, anybody, mm. federal government of Nigeria, all state government, take note of my serious warning. All right. I, ha I am free. I am free now. It was me on the 23rd of August. The question is, who next? Yeah. No one knows. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. We appreciate this time you spent with us. Okay. God bless you. Uh, that was a uh, senior advocate of Nigerian human rights lawyer, Mike Ozekome, who was freed uh, from the kidnappers then. When we come back, we are going to continue our programming today. We are going to bring you a discussion on Syria. We're going to bring you a discussion on the election coming up in Anambra State. So stay tuned. <laughs>